Early one morning, the husband and wife were arguing over who should get out of the warm bed to make coffee. Finally, the wife folded her arms and said, decidedly, you have to make the coffee. It's in the Bible. The husband was shocked. ended up to one of the New Testament books and declared it. It says right here, Hebrews. <laughs> Mark Twain had this to say about a certain person who had died that he didn't like. He said, I didn't attend the funeral. But I sent a nice letter saying I approved of it. <laughs> Three sisters were up in age, and uh, they never did get married, and all of them were getting kind of feeble, and the two older sisters were kind of losing their memory a bit, and so they three got together, and they decided, okay, we can't live independently much longer, so what we need to do is we just need to compile our resources, build a big, nice house, and just all move in it and just look after one another. So they got the house built, and they all moved in, and as they took such a while that the two older sisters were getting more feeble than the younger sister had anticipated. They thought they were going to travel and enjoy life a little bit before it got too bad that they could no longer do that and so they were in the house one day and a lot of stuff was going on and the oldest sister upstairs she got to hollering and she said, called her younger sister and said I can't remember was I getting in the tub or out of the tub <laughs> the middle sister was the middle of the stairs she said I can't remember was I going up the stairs or was I going down the stairs the younger sister said, thank God I never have been as crazy as that. Let me go. I'll be there a minute. i got to check the door. <laughs> Turn with me in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 37, verses, verse 3. I want to continue when God steps in, and the title of my message today is I Believe in Miracles. I do believe in miracles. I believe that God is still on his throne and he still reigns triumphant over every sickness situation that we will face in our lives. Are you there? Where are we going? Ezekiel what? Ezekiel. Ezekiel. 37 and 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for being a miracle-working God. I thank you for the miracles that I have experienced personally in my life. I am a walking, living miracle. I am proof that you can heal and that you can deliver and that you can go against what the natural process of life teaches us. And you can do what no one else can do. You can reverse nature on our behalf. You can make a way when there is no way possible to miraculous supernatural moving of your will into our lives. I'm thankful for the times that you manifest yourself. You make yourself and your presence known, as Mariah said this morning. You show up when we praise you because you told us that you are spirit and you will bless those who worship uh, you in spirit and in truth. We've done that today. We need for the miraculous to evolve into this service. I'm asking you to touch Rodney and Sandy Pilgrim today and Oliver and Donna Martin I'm asking you to touch Sister Dorothy and make her completely healed and whole. I'm asking you to touch Brother Mike Jones' mother. Touch Mike and Brenda, Lord. Heal their bodies. Make them whole. Make them well. I'm asking, Lord, for you to continue to touch those in our church that still struggle with COVID and still struggle with the flu epidemic that's going around and the sinuses. God, I pray for all those that are struggling right now in our church, Lord, that need a breakthrough, that need a turnaround, that need a miracle. You are the God of the impossible. 
And you told us in your word that if any two people on this earth agree as touching anything, whatever we bind on this earth, you will get busy in heaven and you will bind it in heaven also. And whatever we loose on this earth, you will release it from heaven so that it may fall down in our midst and bless us. Now, dear God, I pray that you'll use me, give me the anointing that makes preaching easy and also makes receiving the word of God easy as well. We will praise you for the results. Say you did it and give you glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe in miracles. I just preached a sermon that I preached more than any other sermon in my lifetime, and it's five things that God cannot do. God's never seen a problem he cannot solve. God's never seen a situation he cannot take care of. God's never seen a sickness he can't heal. God has never seen a sinner he can't save. And God has never seen a clean, thirsty, hungry vessel that he could not fill with the Holy Spirit. But there are many other miracles. It's a miracle to know that we serve a God that cannot lie. His attributes, his entire being, which causes him to be holy, causes him to be true, causes him to be filled with love. Basically, because of his attributes, he is sovereign, and there is no one that can be compared to him. In fact, God asked a question one time to one of his prophets, and he answered the question before the prophet could speak back. He said, is there a God beside me? Now, he wasn't just asking, was there a God, because there were many gods, but he was saying, is there sovereignty like me? Do you know of anyone else? Can you go anywhere else? Can you have a relationship with anybody else? Can you have a promise of eternal life to an intimate relationship with anybody else except through my son, Jesus Christ? God said, is there a God beside me? And he says, I know of none. He's sovereign Lord. Nothing will ever be greater than Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and the angels surrounding you in your life. It may seem like it's incompatible. It may seem like it's incomprehensible. And the ability to come through it is, is just almost beyond comprehension. But I will tell you, nothing is too big for God. No challenge is too great. Romans 8 and 33 says, Who shall lay any charge to God's elect? Now, when you break that down and read it and understand what the commentary is saying, he's saying, is there anybody that would dare have the audacity to stand up to any spirit-filled believer or any child of God who's standing in faith and standing on my word, challenge him and say, it won't happen and I won't allow it. He says, when I give you a promise and you receive it by faith, nothing can stop you from receiving the promises of God. I'm thankful for one verse of Scripture, short, tiny verse in Hebrews, where it says the promises of God are yes and amen. Satan doesn't have a bondage where he can lock you up, throw away the key, and keep you from escaping. I want you to know that miracles are still happening today. We've heard it now for a couple of three years with the movie, Heaven is Real. But I, I know heaven is real. Bought my ticket on August the 16th, 1960. Been waiting to go there. Been waiting to see it. Almost been there a few times, but God says Satan's best wasn't good enough. He wasn't through with me, so I'm still here. But I'm waiting on a trumpet to sound, and I'm going there. But beyond heaven is real, I don't want to bypass life. I'm here now. I'm living on this planet now, and I want all the gusto I can get coming from heaven. I believe we need to start preaching God is real. I know it's real because I talked with him this morning, felt the Holy Ghost moving in the avenues of my soul. I'm here to tell you as your pastor today, he said, ask anything in my name and I'll do it. He would not say that if he was not real. Somebody give him a praise. I believe that when God decides to step in and when we allow him to step in, I believe he makes a difference. Amen. Amen. Oh, what a change he made in my life. I mean, remember that old song. 
God was about to step into a valley of dry bones in Ezekiel chapter 37, and he was carrying one of his greatest prophets before the Old Testament would close the books. And he carried him there because he wanted to know if Ezekiel is the right guy, he will attest his faith when I challenge him to do something that's out of the ordinary. These bones are going to live, but they're not going to live under normal situations. They got to return to the old covenant. They got to break up their fallow ground. They got to put their trust back in me. I am the one that gives life and they will not know life the way they dream or believe it can be until they put their trust in me. If everything is going wrong, take a look at your life and find out where Jesus is. Amen. I've looked at a lot of situations over the years. And before I realized it, when I saw the hardness, the treachery of a situation, the bondage of a situation, the absolute coldness and sickness bringing, pushing them quickly to death. There have been a lot of times as a young pastor I was, I felt like the burden of getting well was on me. And I lived with that for a couple of three years before I realized it's not my responsibility to heal them. It's my responsibility to stay prayed up, packed up, and filled with the Spirit. It's my responsibility to know how to respond when certain attacks come to a church or come to an individual. And when I'm called upon, I'm called upon because that person was led of the Spirit to call me. So if it wasn't in me to pray it out into their lives, then God would have never impressed upon them to call me to begin with. And I realized a long time ago, I had to go to God and say, God, I can't take this anymore. God said, I never put it on you. I, you are my spokesperson. All you got to do is tell them about me. God told Ezekiel, and this is where we are. He says, can these bones live? There's a lot of people you know that beat the odds. I've been in the doctor, in the hospital many times and been with a family when they were given the bad news. I'm afraid to tell you they're not going to make it. They made it. It was amazing. They had to take the respirator off. The breathing machine was unhooked, and they said, we don't know how long they'll live. Well, they walked out of that hospital. Praise God. You know, there's people in this church, you got brothers and sisters that's got hearts that the doctors don't even know how their heart is still keeping them alive. I tell you why, because God's on the throne. They're not going to go until God's, it's their time to go. Do you hear what I'm saying? We will never know the witness the world would have never received had God not let them hang around a little while. Let the scoffers and the unbelievers and the naysayers and those who don't believe in God who finally have to come to that resolution, it's got to be God because I know too much about science and the human anatomy to realize if it wasn't a God greater than them, they would not still be here. God asked Ezekiel a question. Can these poor decrepit, degenerate, hopeless, dead nation, and they live. Ezekiel was, reminds me of me. I mean, what are you going to do when God carries you out in the middle of a place and everything around you is dead? There's no sign of life. There's nothing in your arsenal that can give any kind of promise that life or anything will be different after you leave that valley. What can you do when you are utterly hopeless and the only thing you can do is take what you know in God and take who you have in Jesus and release it out of the bowels of your believing? 
Speak faith-filled words and allow the Holy Ghost to take what you have spoken in faith and the angels cover that valley with the glory of God. Well, that's what you do have. You have a testimony. You have a past and you have a present. And because you eradicated the past with the blood of Jesus Christ, you not only have a present, but you have a hope that most of the people in this world today are still looking for and just don't feel like they can find it. They are meandering, aimlessly wandering, never coming to the knowledge of the truth and always falling deeper in the bondage of sin. Ezekiel said what we need to say. I was sharing with Greg earlier. There are times when it's not hinged upon what you believe, it's hinged upon what someone else believes. But God will put you in the middle of that situation because of what you know. One of the perfect examples is Oral Roberts, and I was sharing this with Greg. One of the greatest miracles that Oral Roberts ever preached was over a young girl, nine years old. She was born without any bones in her legs. I mean, they were growing, but they, they were just phalanges, if you will, dangling. Her mother had to carry her for three months. The mother, she and her daughter lived in the car trying to get in under the tent where Oral Roberts was having his healing crusades. Very few times she even made it under the tent to get into the line. Healing services would last three to five hours. And then he would move into the tent aside from the big tent where all the people who are paraplegics, paralyzed people, and people who are on death row, if you will, dying of diseases. He would go in there and never would come out until it was time for him to pack the bags and go home. Finally, she gets on the stage and there she stands with with her daughter in her arms, and Lord Roberts looked at the baby, and he says, ma'am, I can't pray for her. She said, what do you mean you can't pray for her? I've waited for three months. I've been to every service for three months. When you picked up and left Ohio and went to another state, I followed you. We lived in our car. We've eaten in our car. We've lived in our car waiting for you to get it. This is the first time we've got in your presence, and now you tell me that God you preach can't heal. He said, I didn't say that. And I thank God for his understanding. He says, I'm saying to you, I don't have the faith that I need to believe for your daughter's healing. She said, well, I do. He said, okay. I will pray for healing according to your faith. But I will pray according to the anointing that God has given me in the knowledge of the word concerning healing. And we'll see what God does. And he start, she says, start. He started praying and while he was praying, the little dirt girl grabbed him up his collar and says, Mama, she said, not now, honey. Pastor Oral is praying. He said, but Mama, she said, be quiet. And the man who's telling the story of the testimony that's happened, he said it popped up like little toes in her feet. He said it looked like he was blowing up the paper that comes off of a straw and pulls a straw. He said it looked like he was blowing a straw up. And said before Brother Roberts got through praying, the baby jumped out of the, of the mother's arm and ran across the stage. He said there was probably 10,000 people under that tent that night. He said prayer service goes on three to five hours. He said it's the shortest service I ever remember being in. All the years I traveled, everybody was healed. The moment that daughter jumped out of her mother's arm and run across that stage not one person left that belly sick because God healed all praise and no patty cake <laughs> God said to Ezekiel Ezekiel said Lord thou knows he said preach preach you and I need to start telling the good news. I know it's bad, but God is good. And God is good all the time. Amen. I know it looks bad, but God said he'll make a way when there seems to be no way. If you'll help me, we'll have church. It's time we told the lost they can be saved. It's time we told the damned that they can be delivered. 
It's time we can tell the drug addict you can be set free. Under the power of preaching, under the power of singing, under the power of teaching, under the power of testifying, under the power of being obedient to God, you can get up. <laughs> you can stop being a dry bone. Start living. I'm just going to get carnal country with you. It's time you to start saying, devil, I've had enough. Now I have had enough. You've hit me going and coming, and you can't find a thing where you can have a place that you're going to be comfortable. I, I, like, I remember one time I was, I was running a revival, and somebody said, I'd like for sister so-and-so to stand up and testify. And she stood up, and I didn't know what was about to get into. She said, I hate the devil. She about like my family. I don't think she had about 25 kids. Or she's raising her grandkids and her great-grandkids. She breaking me, and I mean the whole side over here was full of kids. She said, I hate the devil. She said, he's attacked me all of my life. Got in my children, got in my family. But we're standing strong. And she said, I'll tell you something else. As long as I got claws, I'm going to claw him. As long as I got feet, I'm going to kick him. As long as I got teeth, I'm going to bite him. If I ever lose my teeth, I'll gum him till I die. <laughs> God told Ezekiel, preach to these dry bones. Don't just preach a mimby pammy sermon. Tell them live. Tell that person, I can't do it anymore. I've tried and I've tried. Everywhere I go, I fail. What are you going to say? I'll tell you what you say. Say, well, get up again. Try again. I'll tell you what my mama used to say. Don't make me come in there. And my dad said, I will turn this car around. God said to Ezekiel, tell those bones to live. We can never admit to failure when we serve a God that works miracles. Amen. I like what Yogi Berra said. Yogi Berra said, it's not over until it's over. Now, he said a lot of other stuff didn't make a bit of sense, but I like what he said in that one. But I like a twist on that. I, I coined this a little. It's not over until I win. If I'm still in the trenches, I'm still fighting. You hear me? I may not be moving as fast as I used to, but I'm still moving. I may be so tired I can't stand up, but I'm standing up on the inside. Hallelujah, somebody. I wish you could feel what I feel up here. There's something up here. A number of years ago, I met a man. Became a very close friend to me. In fact, he's been here since I've been your pastor. I saw him when he was about as low as he could ever be years ago. And then when he came back around, he was fine. He said to me, he said, Johnny, I used to be addicted to heroin. I said, no, uh You know what that is, don't you? No, uh means no, you didn't. No, you wasn't. So I was addicted. I said, well, you look fine now. I said, how in the world are you not still addicted? He said, that ain't the worst. He said, I found something even greater than that, and that was crack cocaine. He said, I became addicted to crack cocaine. He said, I thought addiction to heroin was bad. He said, but I took one snort of crack cocaine and I was hooked. He said, I became absolutely crazy. I didn't know who I was or what I was doing half the time. I'd drive to two, uh, two states away and wouldn't even know getting in the car. Ben had, had relationships with people, never knew I even, didn't even know them. 
wouldn't know them if they walked up and talked to me right now. He said, I was messed up. I said, you look fine now. He said, I am fine now. I said, you can't come back from that. He said, oh, yes, you can. I said, you were hooked on heroin and you were hooked on crack cocaine and you're telling me that you're not hooked anymore? I said, how am I? He said, I met something stronger. I met a man named Jesus. He said, I'm running three crack houses now. People who have been hooked on crack cocaine, I've got three houses, and I don't have enough room. I don't have enough beds. Uh, he said, I, I'm telling him, if you're going to come in here, you're going to accept, you're going to come to church. If you ever bring it in here, you're out. You're gone. Because that's demonically influenced. I'm not going to have that spirit in my house. You're going to get out. You're going to leave. But if you want deliverance, you come to my house. That devil won't stay on you long if you'll stay with the program. I serve a God that can cure anybody of crack cocaine. Somebody praise the Lord. Can these bones live? You talk to that man, he'll tell you they can. Had a job paying over $300,000 a year. Head salesman of one of the biggest Ford places in Georgia. $300,000 a year. Snorted one dose of white powder and he was cooked. Gone. We look at people and we say, well, you know, let's just stay away from them. That's not what God told Ezekiel to do. There's more to these bones than we realize. This is a valley. This is a nation filled with hopelessness, and they had had hopelessness so long, it was all they had in their vocabulary. And You're snared by the words you speak. And God said to Ezekiel, Now I want you to have compassion on them and I want you to stand on the precipice of this valley and I want you to tell these bones to live. I want you to command them to get up. I want you to command them to take charge of their life. I want you to command them to stop talking defeat. I want you to command them and tell them it's not going to be the way the devil has designed it to be in their lives. Tell them to get up! I feel the Holy Ghost. God is more powerful than your problem. Amen. I believe that God can step into your valley. I don't know, I don't know everything is going on, but I know something's going on or God wouldn't have put this on me for two Sundays in a row. I believe that God can step in your valley, and it doesn't matter If there's nothing but dry bones, and all hope is gone. Nobody's coming to your rescue. You don't have anything left. You've wasted it on sin, and Satan has pillaged your life, and all your friends are gone, and all your hope is gone, and you can't find a job, and you, they do a background check on you, and you can't go to work because you, you have been too risky for anybody to trust, and you're there in that pitiful state. I want to tell you, God can work a miracle and give you favor with somebody. I believe that God can step into all of our lives when there's nothing but absolute hope, hopelessness. And God has the power to speak that a hopelessness and hope can arise. God said, is he a priest of these dry bones? You do it every day as, as parents, grandparents. You know, our children nowadays, all they know is social media. All they do is see junk. I don't care if you do get mad. Stupid stuff. You can't grow from that mess. You can't get any edification from that. Hello? Little kid come home from school one day. He said, Dad, I got an algebra test tomorrow and I'm going to fail it. Now, don't come to me about your algebra. You're going to fail it if you come to me. <laughs> I had the biggest argument with my algebra teacher one year. I, I got the right answer, but I didn't do it the way he thought I should have done it. 
I said, what difference does it make if I got the right answer? He said, it's the journey along the way. I said, if you'd been in the valley I've been through, you'd been glad I got to come, come up with an answer to begin with. He said, don't, he said, son, don't tell me you're going to fail it. You got to think positive. You got to say, I'm going to pass it. He said, now start thinking positive. He said, okay, daddy. I got an algebra test tomorrow, and I'm positive I'm going to fail it. <laughs> now, I'll tell you something. Now, in, you know, at, we all go through that. We try to give our kids a pep talk, or our friends a pep talk. But I will tell you something. It takes faith to preach to dry bones. I ought to know. <laughs> Hallelujah. I got you there, praise God. Y'all going to hit me a lot of times. I kind of felt good. I like it. Dry bones don't respond very easily. Because when you start talking hope into a hopeless situation and that's all they have resigned to is hopelessness and you start talking hope to them then all that does is remind them is they got to get up and they got to put forth effort and they got to exercise some muscles and they got to face some challenges and the main reason they're in that valley of hopelessness is because they didn't want to face the challenge to begin with. I'm preaching better than your shout. Maybe I need to come over here and see what this. Let me go over here to the cold and indifferent side. Now start over here for now. Sixteen ninety one, a man by the name of Clopton Havers was interested in the human anatomy. And up until that point they just believed that the bones really didn't have any serve any real purpose. They were just like sticks holding the skin up and the body up. They didn't understand that it was doing all that it was doing on the inside of it. Clopton Havers discovered that there were canals running through all of our bones. Later on, it was those scientists who began to take his word for what he was saying. They saw the canals and they named the canals after him, the Haverson Canals. But in 1691, he thought, the bones on the inside are alive. There's something going on on the inside of the bone. And it wasn't until the 1960s that they began to able to penetrate while a person was living with the right kind of microscopes, x-rays, and they could see that there were blood cells pumping all through the bones and, and they finally realized a doctor doesn't heal a broken leg or a broken arm. All they do is set it correctly but the bone, because it's alive on the inside, the bone heals itself. Can't get doc the doctors can't get credit for that. And what God is saying to Ezekiel to tell the people that were dead, they were alive but they were dead in the belly of dry bones, tell them that there's life in them. God caused a deep sleep to come on Adam. And while he was sleeping, he took a rib out of him. A little kid went to Sunday school one day and the teacher was teaching him how that women came forth in the world. He heard that and he had that story and heard how that God caused a deep sleep to come on Adam and when he woke up he had a bride. Came home from playing one afternoon, laid down on the floor and he said, his mama said, what's wrong with you? He said, I think I'm having a bride. <laughs> well, why are you saying that? Because my Sunday school teacher said when Adam went to sleep, a rib was missing. He said, I feel like something's gone in my ribs. I think God is about to give me a bride. Wouldn't it be great if we could just take the Bible literally like children do? All right, come on, folks. Are y'all with me? 
God told Ezekiel, tell these bones to live. Now let me say this before I close. When you speak in the name of Jesus, when you speak scriptures over somebody, at least that's why I sent you those scriptures last night, you don't have to be there presently. But you send those scriptures and you say, read this, read it, read it over them. Go in that room and you read that over that sick person. You read that over them. God's word spoken out of your mouth by faith is just as powerful as God's word spoken out of God's mouth. It has, the word of God is alive. Say it's alive. It is, it, is, it is operable because of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is subject to the word of faith that is spoken in this world. Wherever there is faith being spoken right now, the Holy Ghost, while he's here in this auditor in this sanctuary while he's here in this room with us he's all up and down this road and he's all up and down Franklin County in Georgia and all over the world where faith filled words are being spoken the Holy Ghost is holding them up and when that word is, is, is directed towards somebody when that word that is directed by somebody is received by faith, it explodes into dunamis in that body. Jehovah Rapha is released, uh, released and the healing power moves in that person's life. God said to Ezekiel, tell him to live. I've known a lot of people in my lifetime that's been crossed off the list. They wouldn't come back from that sickness. They wouldn't come back from that heart attack. They wouldn't come back from that stroke. We've seen people here. When God speaks to impossible situations, God makes the impossible become possible. Luke 17 and 28 says, With man it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. You don't have to stay where you are. You don't have to live a defeated life. Your nose doesn't have to be against the grinding stone all the time. You can rise up in faith and walk in victory. Stand with me, please. I fear it all. Father God, in Jesus' name, I rebuke sickness and suffering and pain. And for those that are listening out and streaming for this message today, I speak faith into their lives. I speak Mary Ann Phillips well and Stanley Phillips completely well and whole. Sister Dorothy Everson, I speak wellness over her body right now in Jesus' name. I declare deliverance by the power of Almighty God. He said, with his stripes we are healed. I command those bones to live. The life that is inside of them, Satan can't touch that. Satan can't steal that. Satan can't destroy that. And I pray that that dunamis that's growing on the inside of their faith will explode and take them to a new level of deliverance and blessing in Jesus' name. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the opportunity to stand before them and bring forth the word of God. Thank you for the challenges that we have from heaven to preach and declare the gospel of truth. Now I pray that you'll go with us, dear Lord, and whatever attacks that Satan is scheming and plotting and planning, give us an endowment of power from on high that we may be able to be victorious. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. See you tonight at 630.